Hey guys, welcome back to Weld.com. So today we got a very special episode for you. Uh, in a previous video, we did some T8 wire in the, uh, the vertical position with a fillet weld, and a bunch of you guys asked in the, in the comment section if we could do an actual test plate. So I have Jerry Matheson here uh, with SelectArc, and he is an applications engineer. So he deals with this wire on a regular basis. So he's gonna go through and show us exactly how to do a good route, the fill passes and the cover passes. We have some uh, three quarter inch plate, half inch backing strip, and this is a regular pre-qualified joint designation from D11, it's the BU2A joint configuration. t 8 is a pre-qualified process used a lot in structural and bridge code, correct? Correct. So D11, D15, and uh, you're CWI as well, so you're yep. familiar with both of those code books. Uh, and you do a lot of demos on this stuff throughout the nation, right? That's correct. Okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and get into it. I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Jerry. He's gonna give you guys uh, some of the ins and outs of how to do this plate correctly. We'll go ahead and refer to the code book. I'll show you exactly the, uh, the joint designation and the, uh, the fit up and prep work that we did with this before we get into it. So we'll go check out the code book real quick. All right, so this is our D11 code book. We're in the pre-qualified section. Um, so I said before we're doing the BU2A, that would be for shield and metal arc welding, but because we're using a like flux, we're gonna drop down here and it's a BU2A-GF. Uh, unlimited thickness, today we're gonna be running on quarter inch plate. And here are the different root openings we can have. So we went ahead and picked a 3 8 root opening. So we have a 30 degree included bevel. So each one of these plates are beveled to 15 degrees. So it's just a slight bevel in here. Each one's at 15 degrees, so when we put them together, we have that 30 degree included angle. Uh, same thing, here's our welding symbol right here. This box up here tells us that we have a backing strip on the back and that our groove weld is gonna be on the arrow side. That's exactly where Jerry's gonna put it. We're gonna put it in the uh, vertical position. As you can see over here, this, this uh, position is pre-qualified for flat, vertical, and overhead. So not horizontal, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, throw this in there and see what we can do. Okay, we're getting ready to start this uh, T8 weld and we're set up on the machine at uh, 202 inches a minute wire feed speed and 20.5 volts. You have to remember to check your volts, try and check your volts as close to the arc as you can because you're gonna have a drop in the, in the output. Uh, so we've already checked that. We're running about 18 and a half volts, 19 volts max. In this joint configuration we were talking about, uh, you can see we have a 3 8 root opening there and you wanna run this with at least a one inch stick out. I would say do not exceed inch and a quarter, but when you're setting up to do the joint, you wanna make sure number one, that you have a uh, sufficient stick out. Uh, and in the root opening we have here, that's not necessarily an issue because you can't get back in there. So you wanna make sure you set up with the tip to work distance that you're gonna be using in the actual root, which is probably the trickiest pass to, to run the, the whole plate. Um, after you have that, you have your, your settings dialed in, then you wanna make sure when you're actually welding that you're actually pulling that puddle uphill. So you're doing a vertical up, but you're actually pointing your wire down into uh, the root at about 20 degrees. And the tighter that is, the more that angle becomes. So in this one, uh, I'm gonna be running probably about 20 degrees as I pull it upward. And uh, we'll put the root in and see, see how it goes. What I'm trying to do is make sure that I get into those corners, but because you have a tight root opening, Sometimes the slag will roll in front of you. You have to be careful, and you can see in that weld when it's finished, you'll see the steps. And as long as the slag comes out completely and you don't have what I call a skipper, where there's actually a base plate you can see into that root, uh, you're fine to go over that. If you have a skipper, you're gonna to have to grind some of that out so that when you run your second pass, you actually burn into that. Otherwise, it won't bend. Just like with uh, stick electrode welding or with gas shield of flux core, uh, you have to hold your sides uh, when you're doing a slight oscillation. And if you don't or if you step too far, you'll get the skippers that I'm talking about. Predominantly um, in the root pass because that's the tightest pass that you run. So you, you have to take care in the root pass, number one, to maintain your stick out, number two, to maintain that downward angle. Now that you have your root pass in there, uh, then you can, you can reduce that angle slightly, but you'll still want enough to push the slag out of the way, going side from side. 
Okay, now you can see where my weave steps are holding the side. We have a couple areas here of concern, but uh, it's been my experience that in my second pass, I'm not too concerned with this. I'm going to burn it out. Some guys will grind the crown off of the, the bead face before they start the next pass. Uh, I'm pretty confident that we're going to be fine here, so I would weld my second pass over that when I get down to an inner pass temperature that uh, I'm comfortable with. This is where a lot of guys uh, fall victim to the let's get it done quick syndrome where this plate is well over 300 degrees and they'll go and start that second pass right away and because you don't have much heat sink here the plate overheats you end up spilling the puddle and uh, you get a lot of frustration and you end up starting over. So I, I would normally try and let this plate cool off at least to two, down to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. If I can let it go longer than that, I will. Uh, the cooler it is when you start, the easier it is to control the puddle. All right, now this is our second pass. I put uh, a second full layer. Normally when we do uh, self-shielded wires, we use a self-shielded nozzle that has an insulator on it and then your stick out's a little bit tighter but you can see for the sake of the video we took the nozzle off so we can get a better shot of the contact tip you just have to take care not to touch the contact tip onto the workpiece or you'll arc it fast okay the technique used on the second pass is very similar to the first pass except my weave is a little bit faster and uh, um, I'm traveling a little bit quicker through the center part of the weld trying to get it a little bit flatter uh, and you could see uh, my angle uh, going in was pointed down uh, in that 10 to 15 degree range and you can see uh, if, if you uh, look a little close you can see I'm getting more fill on the top and on the bottom that's usually a result of the plate getting hot and having to uh, try and speed up and it tends to bag out a little bit more as well so uh, that interpass temperature becomes critical um, from actually throughout the whole plate. Uh, so you can see where we're at here once we clean it off. Okay, this is our uh, second pass. I did a full weave as well. And uh, you can see, just looking at the slag, I'm, I'm out a little bit further up close to the top than I am down here in the start. So I'll have to make that up on my next, uh, my next pass. And what usually happens is because of the, radiate, the radiation of heat, uh, the plate gets hotter as you go up and you get to the top and everything's hot. So uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty typical. Okay, now with this slag, the best way to handle this is let this cool completely because this slag will go to a powder. Um, and that powder is uh, it's an irritant. Um, those of you that have welded with the self-shielded types are well aware of that. Um, but you can see now I've got a much better tie-in on those toes than I had in a root pass. And uh, in a subsequent pass, I'm probably going to go one on this side, one on that side. We'll see how much I get on this one. I may cap this and then one cap to finish. We'll see. Okay, what I'm doing here, I probably should have turned my wire down about uh, five or 10 inches a minute, but uh, I purposely ran this so you could see what happens if you run hot uh, all the way out. Now I'm getting out here close to the top. I'm gonna have uh, more buildup on the top than I do at the bottom. I'll have to blend that out and uh, I could show you what to do with that uh, on my next pass. Uh, I'm still doing a slight oscillation, but uh, making sure I leave enough of room on the far side of this joint so I can get in there on my next pass. Okay, now you, you can see as I was telling you uh, what I got on the top uh, two inches there, I started coming out up to the top of the bevel. So I'm gonna have to grind that out and I'll do that before I put my next pass in there. So what I did is uh, I took an eighth inch grinding wheel and uh, I blended this down some because you can recall I was sticking out past flush and uh, then I went over here on the left side, cleaned this out so I can get down in there. And uh, I think this pass I can cap. I'll make that call once I start and see what kind of fill I get. On this pass, what I actually did was I slowed down my travel. We took some wire out uh, and lowered voltage a little bit. 
so that uh, I could get back in that corner and fill up this side. And I, I'm pretty sure I got a, a good cap on this side. I'll still have to put one more pass on the other side and we should be done. All right, so let's see what it looks like. I'm very happy with that. You can see I have uh, built up the length of the weld, no undercut. So now I just have to brush it, put my cap on and come over about two thirds into this bead. I should be good. Okay, on this uh, last cover pass, uh, I'm trying to get the, the bead over onto the, uh, the first of the cover pass uh, beads that I put in there. And I'm going over there about two thirds to make sure that uh, I have enough reinforcement uh, to be above the, the surface of the plate. And just a slight hold and you can see my torch angle isn't as steep as it, as it was when we were down in the groove because I, I have more room or more area for the weld metal to wet out and uh, keep the slag from getting trapped. So um, the cover pass is the tricky part is not going uh, too fast or too slow and making sure you have your wire speed uh, sufficient to uh, fill, but not so much so that it gets that hot that it spills on you. All right, Jerry, let's see what you got under the hood there. Okay, hopefully we got a good one. I'm pretty happy with that. She's pretty. Yep, I'm pretty happy with it. Maybe a little high up top here. This stuff's tricky to run. So I've noticed that, you know, I've, I had to run it before when I was doing structural steel. Uh, it's different than most other flux cores. It is uh, way different. Uh, a lot of people make the mistake of uh, wanting to go smaller diameter with self-shielded. And I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, as we know it, uh, you know, some of the work that we did with the gas shield of flux core uh, deposition rate, we were doing 045 on that plate size and uh, we were running about uh, 270, 280 amps and we're able to really make a nice looking bead. On this, when you go to uh, a 116 self-shielded, you're really looking at basically maybe six, seven pounds an hour deposition. You're not even getting what we were getting with the 045 and the horizontal. So. I always try to encourage people, try to go larger. And it's funny because geographically, I'd say probably uh, a lot of, uh, of the buildings and bridges that go up on the, on the West Coast are done with 072. In the Northeast, I know it's predominantly 564. Uh, it's just a matter of what uh, you know, guys get used to running mm -hmm. and they're comfortable with. And this is 072. And I chose 072 because we're doing a small plate. If we're on a job or we're doing moment connections or column splices, I'm much more comfortable with 564s. Okay. And then let's, let's talk about some of the applications specific to uh, T8 wire. Okay. Um, as far as uh, the buildings, it's used a lot on uh, uh, multiple level buildings and thick sections of uh, moment connections where uh, a, a beam will actually go into a column and you'll do uh, the top and the bottom flange of, a, of an I-beam. Mm -hmm. um, then you have uh, concerns on the bottom side of uh, what uh, the D18 or the seismic code uh, references is uh, a limited access where you actually cut a rat hole and you reach through and you start. Um, in those cases, self-shielded wire is, is used, uh, uh, I would say, probably more now than ever. Uh, a lot of those applications will use a, a T6, uh, flat and horizontal, slightly higher deposition rate, uh, but all your shear tabs and uh, some of the miscellaneous uh, things that are done on job sites are done with uh, the self-shielded T8 types. Definitely appreciate you coming in. Thanks for giving the viewers some additional knowledge on this stuff. Um, again, if you guys have any questions about it, go ahead, drop them in the comment section. We'll be happy to help you out with anything we can. Uh, Jerry, thanks for coming out, man. We really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, having me. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure to like and subscribe. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And until next time, make every well better than your last.